<laughs> Hi, it's Dave. Welcome. So today I'm joined by Fatima Haidari, and I am privileged and honored to have her on my show and uh, on this channel. Um, we've had the honor to get to work together very closely over the past two weeks, uh, together with some other of her friends. And together we've been able to get over actually 38 people, over five families out of Afghanistan and through the border into Pakistan. And so today I want to kind of dive into the story of, you know, how we got connected, um, dive into the story of how Fatima had the idea to try to get her family out and what we did to make it happen. And we'll kind of conclude with some, you know, next steps or some challenges that they, that they might be facing now. So Fatima, welcome. Um, can you kind of tell us kind of a, a brief summary of like what you were thinking um, prior to the Taliban uh, taking over Kabul and then also when Ka the Taliban took over Kabul and you have all your family or most all of your family there, um, what was going through kind of your mind at that time? Yeah, sure. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much. And thank you for supporting me through this difficult time. I really appreciate your work and your support. So my name is Fatima Haidari and I belong to Hazara Ethnic Group. And currently I live in Victoria, BC, which is in Canada. Yeah, I think prior to that, like I got in Canada in 2015. So that's when I wanted my family to go to a different country, like to go to Pakistan. At, initially, I was thinking of Tajikistan, but it wasn't an easy decision. Uh, like they are building a house. They're like, OK, let's finish off that work and then we're going to go or let's see your sister get a little bit older, like, you know, because they were really young at that time. And financially, it was also I was not in that position to support them because I was like recently moved to Canada at that time. And then, so it took like six years and it, like, I think it was eventually I convinced them to go to Pakistan. Not all of them, like so my mom, um, four of my sister, my sisters and one of my brother. So they took the ticket, like they booked their ticket and they um, got Pakistan visa. And they were, uh, their, their flight was on 16th of August, 221. And then that was already when Taliban took over on 14. So I did tell them to book the flight for a first week of August. And they're like, okay, what if we do it like for the first of September? I was like, no, there's a timeline I will give you until August 20. If you don't do it, I may not carry with, uh, with this like uh, plan. And they made it on August 16, so which didn't work. So when were they trying to, like, when did they get the Pakistan visa and when did they buy their plane ticket? Um, maybe two weeks, or maybe uh, sometime in July, maybe late July. I see. So, so be, at that time, you already were seeing the situation. The Taliban was taking over more territory. So you felt like sooner or later, you thought maybe the Taliban would take over it. Right? Yeah, and also the place that I'm originally from, Molistan, like that was taken over two months ago prior to I that, see. and there's so many atrocities. And also we have family members that we had no connection with them because yeah. they cut down the tail services. So I was like, okay, that's going to come, like even in Kabul, because they started like starting from one place and they moved to a different province, different district. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it wasn't very easy for my mom because she was always saying, okay, what about those other people? What about your grandparents? What about your uncles? Like, we have that chance probably to leave the house, but what ha is going to happen to other people? And then I told him, like, I wish I had like the capacity to help everyone. But at yeah. this point, like, if you're in a safer situation, probably eventually you can help them. But yeah, I had to do lots of talking and calling and convincing. And kind wow. of they were changing their mind one day and then the other day I was like, okay, you're going to leave. And the other day they were like, no, I don't think we can. Because especially for my parents, my mom is 50 and my dad is 51. They were like saying, okay, at this age, if you go, we don't know where to go. And the language, we don't know. Yeah. Then we won't be able to work. And we don't know how long it's going to take for us to resettle in Canada. And then what if nothing works and we have to go back at that time? Yeah. Like we don't have anything. So Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's um, a big, big decision to try to leave. So this was months in the wa making then. You're trying to convince them over many months, right? Um, over six years. I over six say. years, wow, yeah. okay. Um, how did you, um, What? how old were you when you um, got to Canada? Uh, I was 17 uh, at the time when I got to Canada without my family member, so I went to the US, I got a scholarship for two weeks, but I wasn't able to attend the program because there was some technical problem at the US Embassy in Kabul, but my visa was valid for like a year 
and because the situation of Afghanistan was even not good at that time, it was mm-hmm. keeping like especially in Dasht Parti, mm-hmm. there were like target killings, like suicide bombs, and then my family and I decided for me to go to Canada because. Um, and they were like, ideally, we should have gone together, but because you're the only one who has the U.S. visa, so I should like take this chance. And even that was a stressful journey because I didn't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And I, I just mean, you're wish se- the uh, hope for the best, and I did it, so and it worked yeah. out. Yeah, so you're, I mean, 17 years old, um, you're by yourself, you make it to Canada after, you know, um, the U.S., um, what was kind of your initial experience? Were you, was there a culture shock? Was, did you have like any loneliness kind of, did, or were you able to quickly find friends or did you find people even from Afghanistan your age? Like what was that type of you know, time for you? Mm, if I go, because I left Afghanistan on August 13, 2015. And that's uh, like, I had a flight from like Kabul to Dubai and I had 12 hours transit. At that time I was good, but as soon as I got the plane heading to the US, I felt like so stressed out. Mm-hmm. I was thinking that everyone knows that I'm going to cross border mm-hmm. the border. <laughs> and I was like, just like, yeah, I felt like, okay, someone is thinking. At that time I was like, okay, this is an illegal thing that I'm going to do. What's going to happen? And I was also worried that if I get blacklisted, mm-hmm. then I won't be able to go to either Canada or the U.S. Mm-hmm. And then it was so much, uh, so, like, an, yeah, unknown. And even at the airport, like, I remember the day, like, when I got at the airport, they said, like, U.S. citizens or Canada Canadian citizen on one side and people who don't hold, like, those countries' passport on the other side. So I had a long talk with the airport, like, almost an hour. And I was so scared that they were going to send me back. Mm-hmm. And then when I left the airport after a long kind of discussion, I wasn't sure which way to go. Mm-hmm. I just randomly was like, okay, I'm going to go to this side. Hopefully I'm going to, like, I just knew that I'm going to look for a motel or a hotel to stay. Mm-hmm. And then I, the first person who came, like, was walking towards me and I asked her, like, oh, I'm looking for a hotel. Do you have an address? She said, sorry, I don't know. And then I kept walking and then there was a Japanese man. He helped me a lot. He uh, took me to his office and then he looked up for motel and he called them and he dropped me off. Mm-hmm. But yeah, this kid, like, something that I didn't do is I didn't ask his number, but I still hope that one day if I go there, I'm going to find that person. <laughs> the work he did was, like, at that time, like, he saved me. Uh-huh. Yeah, and after that, I took, I think I was there for three nights or four nights, and then I took a taxi to go to, um, went to Canadian border, and then I crossed the border. At that time, I didn't know anyone. I knew only one friend, but she was in Toronto, like, in a different province, which is, like, far five hours mm-hmm. away by the plane. I didn't know anyone and then, yeah, I just randomly, yeah, I didn't know, it was hard. I think for the first two weeks, I was just kind of, I didn't know, but after, I think for the first week it was, I didn't know how I was feeling because I was mm-hmm. so like, you know, in a new place and like everything, it's like, okay, at least I crossed the border, at least there's not a fear of mm-hmm. like me sending back. And then I had a phone call with my mom. That's like when everything was like, oh, I couldn't. That's that hit really hard. And I was like, as soon as I had that discussion with them, mm-hmm. and I just start crying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for a good, I don't know how many minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and especially because my mom didn't know that I'm gonna seek asylum here, because she has like nine children, and like I, was, I didn't want to add another like worry on her plate. I was like, I'm gonna go there to study, and if things. As things get better, I'm gonna stay for longer to start, continue my studies. But if not, uh, I will see how it goes. Basically, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, like in my kind of ex- like when I um, in my twenties, I traveled a lot, and um, I spent like I think probably over half of my twenties overseas in different countries. But mm-hmm. every time I came back, it was kind of difficult because it was hard to relate. People, people, it was hard for, for me to relate with others or others couldn't relate with me. I would share some stories and it just, it didn't like connect with people, you know? Mm-hmm. And like one of the, the places I did go to was Afghanistan back in like, you know, end of 2001, early 2002. And, you know, I have so many actually memories from that time and the people and the children and the warmth 
the connection. There's something about you know the people there, um, mm. and but it's also a, a place of you know of, of extreme hardship for many people and insecurity, instability, and tension. When you're in Canada, let's say you're 17 years old, you came to you know by yourself. You're stuck in this new country, new culture, new language. How how can people relate with you? Like how you know how can and how can you relate with others? You know, you grew up maybe in a different in a different world almost. You know, different planet maybe almost it might feel sometimes. Like, yeah. Like how, I think. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I think it depends who I interact because some of the people like their initial responses like oh you're so brave you're so in like courageous and then the, the response I have is like okay it wasn't like a kind of choice to be brave like you, I was forced into it because there was no other solution so I, at that time I was like okay this is the only way out I'm gonna try it although I didn't know what's gonna happen uh, but I guess the connection that I think uh, I was in grade 11 when I started like socially studies 11 mm -hmm. that book talks about indigenous people in Canada mm -hmm. So as soon as I read about them, and then my teacher was really good, he, he was explaining everything really good, and that's really like when I got to know more about colonization. So when I, like with that people, with indigenous people, uh, because of what, I, what has happened to them, I found so many similarities, the way they have been treated and the way how my people have been treated. Not to level up, because there are certain things that don't like level up, but there's so much similarities in terms of history book for them, it was kept out of history books. It was not taught. And the same with my, with my people. Because I studied until um, grade 12 in Afghanistan, but there wasn't a single history book that talked about Hazara people, although we are the second largest ethnic group. Mm -hmm. So that's when I was like, okay, this is... Uh, and I attended like indigenous workshop, indigenous spaces. So that's when I really dig down. I was like, okay, I'm going to learn more about my people. And like get you got connected to Hazara advocates. Uh, yeah, with those people, yes. And then here is also like lots of refugees from different countries. Uh, like, yeah, from Iraq, Syria. When I talk to them, I know like, okay. And like the first program that I attended, it was a youth program for refugees. So that really, I felt like, okay, we came from different parts of the world, but we have such a, despite the differences, we have a common ground, which is being refugee, which is like seeking safety in a, another country. And there was similarities, the fact that some of, uh, most of us were not with our families. So we just came like somewhere. Yeah. So like, I think with those, I do, it depends which, uh, who I interact. Some people are like, I feel like there is a shared similarities and experiences, but for others, I don't know. It feels different. <laughs> like, you know, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, you're brave, you're this, you're that. Like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> kind of yeah, thing, yeah. yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Um, so you finished high school um, in Canada. And um, where did you go to college? Uh, I studied uh, in a year for a year in adult school. After that, I went to Langara College. It's in Vancouver. I sat there for two years. And after that, I transferred to Simon Fraser University, which is in Burnaby. And so I transferred last summer, so when COVID started. Okay. And then I have one more semester to go. Hopefully, I will finish off my bachelor's degree in December this year. Okay. What major? I'm doing joint major in criminology and women's studies. Mm -hmm. And what's your kind of aspiration, you know, with choosing that major? What do you want to be doing? Let's say five or ten years down the road. Do you have any, like dreams or things that you think if everything turns out great hypothetically oh, wow. like even thinking about that if everything's just like wow yeah, sounds um, good feels uh, good yeah, yeah. <laughs> i know i know <laughs> your family's still in pakistan and we'll talk about that in their escape but let's say hypothetically everything works out your family's in canada um somehow and like what do you want to be doing in 10 years because I have personal experience with refugees, like being a refugee and my family is now refugee and I have so many people I know that they are refugee. So I feel like kind of creating an organization, nonprofit organization, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of more of like supporting refugees and women, because mm -hmm. that's like where my major kicks in. 
um, yeah, that's like the goal. I don't know how long it's going to take, but, and also I'm thinking of like immigration lawyer. Mm-hmm. Maybe I don't know which one I will decide, but those are like the potential um, things I want to do yeah. if everything goes well. Yeah. Someone, uh, just, uh, someone I've been chatting with, um, a teacher, um, in, who used to teach in Kabul, she texted me this, um, contact. She says, maybe you should talk with, or I should call, uh, Kim Motley. She's a human rights lawyer who's done a lot of work in Afghanistan. Have you heard of Kim Motley before? Her first name is, I think, yeah. familiar. Yeah. She's a, a lawyer. She seems to be doing stuff in the U S and in Afghanistan. For quite a while, um, but yeah, it was. It's interesting the the idea of um, you know doing criminology and maybe law, um, but also immigration or you know advocating for people. Um, yeah, I think um, definitely there's a lot of power, you know, a lot of need um, for that. Um, let's go back to your family here. So you're trying to get them out for six years, right? I mean, ever since you got to probably Canada. Yeah. Um, so you're 17 back then. Are you 23 right now then? Yes, okay. I'll be 24 in a month. Okay, got it. Yeah. So you've been trying so hard and then finally you get, you know, at least part of your family to get plane tickets and a Pakistan visa and then like the Taliban take over. Do they make it to the airport at all or do they just not go? Yeah, they tried two times. Like the first day was on August 16th. So that's when they showed up. They had their stuff packed. Uh, visa, tickets, documents. They waited there for so long and nothing happened. At the beginning, there was no one around, basically. Mm-hmm. But they waited there for, cool, I don't know, many hours and then it oh. got really crowded. And that's when things got really out of hand. People were just like, um, like crowded, so many people and they were kind of hitting people to, like, you know, to disperse them from the airport. And then my family, like my sisters, they were saying that this was our first time seeing Taliban from that close distance, and they saw children getting hurt, uh, injured, and like so many chaos. And then I was chatting while they were there. They sent me a few videos mm-hmm. with one of my sister, and then all of a sudden, sudden the connection got like I wasn't able to communicate. And then I have one sister in Germany, and she was like, "Oh, what's gonna happen? What's ha- what has happened?" And I was like, maybe they are just like boarding or something. And like the internet is not going to work. But later on, I wasn't at the clubhouse. And then she texts me like, okay, check your Instagram. And then I went to check there. There was a video like when people were getting shot. So basically they were shooting people just to send them like, basically asking them to leave. And I think they didn't because everyone was so desperate to leave the country. And that's when, like, it was two hours, but it felt like years. So I almost had a panic attack at that time. Mm -hmm. I was just figuring out what to do. And then I usually have, like, crisis line saved in my phone because of the situation. And then, so first of all, I asked my friend because I didn't have international call. I gave them their number. I gave her, like, can you check on them if they are okay? And she said no response. And then I was like, wow. And I felt guilty at that time. I was like, okay, I asked them to show up. I asked them to do this. What's going to happen? I will, like, will I see them again or not? Mm-hmm. And lots of questions. And then like yeah. kind of nightmares. Uh, and then I gave my brother-in-law's number. She got connected to him. And he said that they couldn't make it because it was really bad. And they came back. They were on the way to come back. So and then I called the crisis line at that time while I was not able to talk to them. Mm-hmm. And I as soon as the person on the other side of the line said hi, I was like, I couldn't hold it anymore. I just cried, cried for like six minutes or something. Mm-hmm. And then I explained here what's happening. Uh, yeah. And at that night, I couldn't sleep. I think since it's August 14, it's like maybe two nights or three nights that I'm kind of trying to sleep. Mm-hmm. Before that, I was just like, getting, like, just thinking what to do, like yeah. help them to save and leave the country. So that was, I think, one of the most difficult like night of my life I think wow I mean if they would have just gotten the ticket like one or two weeks earlier you know or the the, the departure date if they would have just you know they would have been able to get out more easily but it's just it happened so fast um, yeah it happened yes, so it fast um, wow crazy so yeah. um, your family let's say what is not able to get out anymore the airport's pretty much shut down they had tickets out you know everything um what are you thinking right now like are you just at that time you know 
Did you have any ideas or what were you trying to do? Uh, I was basically thinking, um, I didn't know then my brother is in the U.S. because he lived in Afghanistan on August 13th and he was like a full, uh, full, full bride recipient and he, I think, started to apply for SIV visa. I was like, okay, that's one thing. And But if they cannot get to the airport, so like, mm-hmm. I was not so hopeful of that, mm-hmm. about that, especially that they had to go to the airport themselves. I was like, okay, if they go, they have to carry the documents. If the Taliban find the documents, that's the end of it because that shows like where they have worked, their documents, and especially if they have a like foreign visa, that's gonna be so problematic. But at the same time, I was hoping I was like maybe they won't stop them. Maybe they can make it to the airport. Maybe this time they can get on the plane. But um, and then I guess that's when I met you because I'm usually on Clubhouse. That's because of the community that I got connected. Mm-hmm. And then I saw a room is still, it said evacuate Afghans. I was like, okay, this is something that I have been thinking. So <laughs> maybe this room has something, some good things to offer. And then I went there. And then I think at that time you and only Mahdi, you and Mahdi mm-hmm. were like speakers. I was like, yes. okay, it doesn't seem crowded. I'm going to go and join and see what's going to happen. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when I was like, okay, I'm just planning to for them to leave. I don't know which country, but I, I knew that Pakistan is closer, so mm-hmm. probably Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that clubhouse, it was, I, um, I think Mehdi, uh, he's a Afghan um, national in Australia. He runs his own YouTube channel and watches mine as well in finance. But um, yeah, he contacted me and said um, he had a bunch of um, people he knew or, and, you know, he wanted to... to and actually, he was just DMing me, and I said, "Hey, let's let's. I want to learn more about you know what's going on. I want to connect with people. Let's do a clubhouse." And and that's when you joined. Um, and um, at that clubhouse, did was Rabia part of that clubhouse too? She was listening, she was but listening. I think okay. it was me talking, and okay. then you, I explained my situation, and then you were giving me like uh, ideas, yeah, kind of solutions. You're like, okay, not so many family have a family member outside the country, so you can really advocate for them. And then that's when I was like, okay, I'm gonna follow. And yeah, and then I followed you on Twitter and I said like, okay, what can I do or what should I do? How were you able to trust me? (laughs) I mean, I think the background information that Mehdi gave, Uh the fact that he, I didn't watch the video yet, that's on my list. So (laughs) how you like had a video about like how your family uh, yeah. like escape North Korea mm-hmm. and there's something I was like okay if someone has like experience like per- that personal mm-hmm. for me lived experiences like I value it so much and I was like okay there's like a deep connection there mm-hmm. like even if it's long long time ago <laughs> I was like okay this person knows the pain and the suffering that come out of this kind of situation yeah. so and he's willing to dedicate his time and yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I've taken, uh, you know, in my 20s, I took various trips into North Korea. And um, a few times I went actually, um, I, I was able to see um, some people reunite with their families in North Korea. But this is like after 50 or 60 years, I've never seen them. And like having almost no communication at all. And some of them are brothers or, you know, they haven't seen each other from, mm-hmm. or sisters. They haven't seen each other f- since they're kids, you know, like seven or eight years old, but they have memories. And seeing them meet each other after like 60 plus years or something, um, and seeing the tears, like seeing that mm-hmm. connection um, and the pain, you know, the pain of, of that separation, like, that and then not just for one people seen it over and over and over and so many people carrying that pain inside um and seeing it up close it's yeah it, it's um yeah it definitely changed you know um yeah how I view things. and also one thing that one of the like hazara scholar he's really good mm-hmm. he said something that was like really hit hard during this time he was like knowing his pain mm-hmm. like i was like wow that's such a like it's like put so beautifully because that captures because then past few weeks I was like okay every time I was thinking about the solution I was like knowing is pain mm. like you know the situation is really bad and you're kind of stuck mm-hmm. and then like it just hurts you and uh, you know that people who, who you love the most they are also getting hurt so yeah 
Yeah. Um, so after our clubhouse, um, I, I think I invited you and Rabia on for an interview. I, I forget, how, how did I get Rabia first? And then you, was it, did I yeah, reach out it, to you or how, do you remember? I was talking to you, planning, and then the goal was like, okay, ask your family to leave to Kandahar at that time, I yeah. guess. And then they are going to cross the border. And then at that, I went to Rabia's place because that's like August 13 was my last final. So I had oh. planned to go to visit her. And then she was all saying that, oh, the situation is really bad. What should I do with my family? And I was like, oh, I'm also planning, but I don't know a lot of uh, information yet. But I can connect you to Dave. Just tell him that, uh, yeah, but talk to him and he has a, he might have a solution. Got it. Yeah, yeah. I remember um, I was interviewing. I guess we were talking with Robbie and then you were there. Um, yeah. And then I wasn't planning on like posting the video. I was re recording it to keep. But um, after the interview, I'm like, wow, it's like it's not really related with my channel. But I felt mm -hmm. like if your guys' story got out, maybe there could be some people out there who could help in different ways. Um, so yeah, what was amazing is when we were starting to talk and we found out the border into Pakistan was open down by Kandahar, um, our biggest need was, you know, I didn't know anyone in Pakistan and plus the families didn't have enough money really to not just make the trip, but to cross the border and pay the agents to help people cross. And so we had to find somebody in Pakistan and our interview actually um, two weeks ago, it, um, yeah, I, I still remember it. Like one of um, the people watching, he's a, he's a person in Europe, Afghan national. So it, it's amazing. It's like people on my channel, like it, who would have known <laughs> that, that, that all these Afghan nationals in different countries are watching my, my channel, right? Because Mehdi <laughs> was uh, Afghan in um, Australia, right? And yes. he DM'd me and we had a clubhouse, I met you. There's another Afghan national in, in, in Europe and he DM'd me and he says, Dave, I watched your interview, you know, with Fatima and Rabia and it really like, you know, hit me. Um, I'm Afghan and my family, I have family and um, people I know in Quetta, Pakistan. Um, let me know if you need some help. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what we're looking for, right? So I, I'm like, please, please, please help us, help us, help us. And <laughs> I got on the phone with this, um, this brother and we started talking and we were able to find a contact that I just had no idea, you know, otherwise how we could have found. found. But that's kind of the, the interesting story of, of, of how this stuff comes about is, is in this hyper-connected world where, mm -hmm. you know, there's Twitter and YouTube and Instagram and all this stuff. It's there's interesting power to use it for good to, to, you know, you help people and you get a following, but you also, I think in certain times of need, um, people can rally together and make what make something that's impossible seem possible, you know? And I think with your guys' story, it, was, it almost felt impossible at different times. You know, one exactly, time was, yeah. it's like, we don't know anybody out there, you know, it's like, how do we even, <laughs> you know, try to, you know, help people cross the border. Um, but your family was one of the first, it took them a couple days to pack. I was like, really anxious saying, if you want to go, it's open. I don't know how long it's going to stay open. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, every day I felt like it's a closing window because more and more people might go. Um, but um, your family had a lot of people, you know, it's, and they had a lot of things yeah. to do. I'm and sure, that means yeah. a lot of work for me. I had to convince every single one. And they were like, no, you're not going to go. I'm like, you don't have any other option. It's going to close. And they were like, yeah, it was a huge, um, yeah, a hell of journey. So so, so you're calling then, all of the people and they're they're debating with you, arguing with you, <laughs> saying, Lit wait a little bit. Or what, what, what's their kind of um, reason that may hesitation? Um, what were you kind of battling? I think for my mom, because my grandparents and my uncle and my mom, my grandma, she's like really attached to my mom. And she's like, she has been really close with my mom. Like before moving to Kabul, like we were living like 30 minutes away. And then even in Kabul. So she was saying that uh, if she goes and she has high blood pressure, my mom was worried about that too. Like uh, something, if something happens to her because of me and stuff like that. So that was one of them. And then like, um, they were still kind of hoping that they will wait for the Pakistan visa to see if the flight is going to be running, the commercial flights. But I said, there's no hope. 
and also because they didn't have money like the money was stuck in the house and then like three houses now it's set and then we could not send money to the bank the banks were closed and like and also because i have younger uh, siblings and also my nieces they were really young one of them is like not even a month uh, a year i mean and then when my uncle's family joined they also had like five children so i think their hesitation was okay we don't know where to go and this many people um and basically like also like living in a country for like that many years living is not easy and my mom was saying that okay we moved a few times so now we're going to go to pakistan and what's going to happen next mm-hmm. and like when we are going to stop this moving from one place to another place and i was like i wish i knew the answer but now this is the only way that we can get out of the country and then i was like i'm going to try my best to do anything that i can in my power from like this side of the world Yeah. Were they concerned if they left Afghanistan like how would they survive in Pakistan like what would they do how long would they stay there Yeah I did give that reassurance that I will try and my mom was like okay we were 18 people mm-hmm. uh, but my uncle I was like at that time it was tough as I was thinking but ideally I was be able if I was and then my mom was like okay you're one person you're a student still you work part time how can you say something that it doesn't make sense And I was like, okay, I'm going to try to get another job or I'm going to ask someone. And she was like, mm, I don't know, but. Mm-hmm. And then I did tell them that, okay, this is, uh, it was kind of, I was saying, it's your decision, but you have to do it this way, you know. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, I did say that, okay, this is a risky route. I'm going to say you, this is the only way out, but I'm not going to take any responsibility at the end of the day. Despite saying that, later on they were sending me voice messages. Do you made us move? You made us to do this. <laughs> But deep down, I was mad. I was like, okay, if you made that move like two years before, it was mm. not easier. But I was like, no. I did something on Facebook. Someone posted like, don't bring up those advices that you gave before crisis. I was like, okay, that is stuck, uh, is stuck in my mind. And I was like, okay, we're gonna have a long conversation about that later on. But now I'm just gonna try to convince you all to yeah. go. Yeah. Um yeah, that's um wow. It's especially traveling with young kids. I can imagine, especially babies, you know, under one years old. Um it's a long trip uh Kabul to Kandahar is like 13 hours and it's um and it's, you still have to go more to the border and the border is a mess as yeah, well. And also the fact that they showed up at the airport two times that really traumatized them. Mm-hmm. They're like, "Okay, Kabul, like my, our place is like maybe one hour and a half from the airport. They're like, oh, okay, wow. if you're not able to get to the airport from that close distance, how can you expect us to be on a car, in a car, like for 13, 14 hours, mm-hmm. passes two provinces, which are really not safe, Kandahar, especially in Ghazni. Mm-hmm. And then like uh, after that, we were trying to cross another border. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I wish there was a safer way, but this is the only way. Yeah. yeah, I think that the airport experience really, mm-hmm. because when they showed up for the second time, they saw people like they were using tear gas, mm-hmm. like they were hitting people, like uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I think you know one thing working with you um, and helping your family is, I notice is you have this thing where you're very, um, especially when the Taliban fell or Taliban took over Kabul, mm-hmm. it felt like you. got into a sense of urgency like you really mm-hmm. felt like every hour every day was ticking and th- they had a limited time you know that they could at least get out more easily than later later might be much harder like but not everybody had that attitude um like where do you think that ad- attitude comes from is it do you think the Taliban is going to you know make it harder do you think do you think it's a it's a new era in Afghanistan do you think this is going to last do you think the Taliban will be there for quite a while and what's your picture of where Afghanistan is leading or is headed to i think for me because like i i'm really into like uh, i read articles a lot when i can and then i'm kind of connected with a few like advocacy group And also, like, just starting considering from 2015 to 2021, the number of atrocities has, has happened, like, in eastern part of Kabul, which is, like, Hazara-dominated group. 
because we are a minority like group like in terms of religion and ethnicity so that put us in a danger, like greater danger and like the fact that our people have been killed like over 62 percent like back in 1989 i think so those were all the contributing factors i was like okay at that time there was like a shaky government in place my people would be killed in that great number like they were attacked like mosques gyms uh, wedding halls uh, school uh, education center and everything i was like okay if they don't have mercy on children like as young as 12 or even younger and also i lost so many like uh, i knew friends who lost their family members and uh, yeah i know a lot of them and then i had friends who got injured at that time i was like okay this makes only matter even worse so like it's i can't measure the pain that comes uh yeah and because of that i was like there's no way that's gonna be better Mm-hmm. And because, like, it was a con- constant fear for my people, especially. Not saying that it doesn't impact other people, it does. But for us, because of the um, the way we look, we have really distinct feature, and um, like the language we speak, the religion we practice. It's like, no, like you cannot hide it basically. And we saw all that at the border too, like how we were singled out. So, yeah. Because of that, I was like, okay, I have to make a quick decision and just encourage them. Even if it's not like certain, you know, there's but it's still there's a slim chance for them to um, uh, to get somewhere that is a potential safety there because I knew in our own Pakistan it's not gonna be easy yeah. for them. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so your um, 19, um, 19 family members start making their way down from Kabul. Um, did they take the bus, do you know, or was it car? Yes, they took it was the, the bus. bus. Okay, so the buses were still kind of running. Um, that's yeah. good. They saved some money. Um, Shagofa and some others had to, you know, they had to hire <laughs> yeah, a driver. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, driver and car, which is much more pricier. But you guys got to Kandahar, um, and your family stayed overnight, I think, right? In Kandahar, yes, right? Did, yeah, I think because they reached early, not early enough, so it yeah. was like better for them to stay overnight and then try the morning. Got it. Next day, they, they go to the Boldak border. Um, and I mean, this is like, for people who don't know, this is like, there's a lot of people there, you know, like thousands mm-hmm. and thousands crowded. And you have to pass, it's a, it's not like a simple border. It's like three gates and another station to cross. And um, your family, and after, if you get rejected once, you can go back and try again if there's enough time in the day. And so you can try multiple times in a day, but the first day only one family member of yours crossed out of nineteen, and then three from Rabia. Who crossed in your family the first day? Oh, the person who helped us out later on. Okay, got yeah. it. Okay, yeah. uh, so he crossed first, maybe because he knew how to cross better, or um, because he has a. Um, he doesn't look like Hazara. Got it. So that was a ticket for you. Like yeah. if you didn't, if you could hide that you're not Hazara, then like yeah, you're bonus. And then, yeah, Got and it. I think he knew the border a little bit more because he had the previous experience, but mm-hmm. that was with someone else, not by himself. Yeah. Got it. So, so the other 18 weren't able to cross. Were you able to talk with them that day or that night? Were they, how were they feeling? I just heard some no- <laughs> messages mm-hmm. that some of them, they were like, okay, this is the end of it. You cannot do it anymore. Mm-hmm. Like they were really, it was really bad. They didn't let us pass. Uh, we we're going to go back. So that was my like fear that at some point they are gonna decide to go back, mm-hmm. and then I kind of ignored the like you know the mad message the one that they were like really frustrated and I was like ignored like I was like okay they are still there so, and then I was like um, I know it's not easy even if I say it is it's I'm not saying it is but that's the only way you made like uh, you are on the bus for fifteen fourteen hours, so if you go back it's gonna get only worse. And then somehow I had to message them. I was not able to talk directly, mm. but they were like using WhatsApp messaging. They were sending voice messages. Got it. But I just knew that they didn't pass. So and yeah. then yeah. Yeah. Um. The next day, eighteen of your family members. This is, um, over a week ago actually. Um. But they, uh, after probably multiple times, I think right that second day they made it. Do you know how many times they tried that second day before they made it across? Okay, I think the first try was only one person passed. I think the second try, no one did. And the third one, I think my uncles, like family of nine, they were able to pass after a long 
process. Um, and then I think for my mom and my sisters, I took them five tries or wow. something. At the, at the fifth try, they were able to pass. And they passed, I think, right near the, when they were closing the border, right? Like 3 p.m. or something in the afternoon. Yeah, my mom said that we started walking at 11 and it yeah. took us three hours to reach the gate. Uh-huh. And that's when, because they at that time, the border is closed on Afghanistan side. Mm. So that's why they were able. And because they also found a good person, you know, someone has a better connection with the police and everything. Yeah. Um, so your family make it to Quetta, and then what happens next? Um, like, where did they, did you guys have any uh, relatives there or people you guys knew to help out? Um, for my uncle's family, they made some arrangements already. I think one of their sister-in-law lives there. Okay. And for my family, it was my sister-in-law's family. So I think they stayed one night there, and then after that, they find my mom, my dad's cousin or something. I see, okay. Yeah. So some relatives But there. not like a lot, it's maybe two families. Yeah, yeah. And then what, um, what are the challenges that your family faces right now in Quetta, Pakistan? Um, have you talked with them? What are they doing? You know, what are some of you know, the issues that they face? It's a shock for them. And my younger sister, she says like, oh, it's not like Kabul. It's really different. The alleys are really tiny. The houses are not good. <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> because the place they came, it's like different, you know? Uh-huh. She's like, okay, all of us only in one, one bedroom. And there's like, so, yeah, it's like a shock for them. Mm-hmm. And like my mom, I think it has been like, I think four or five days that she keeps trying to look for a house. Uh, for rental, it's extremely hard because there's so many people. So people like go to a mosque, a wedding halls, anywhere that they can. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and also the price is really high. People just doubled it. Like, mm-hmm. and she was saying that's even high. Like impacted the groceries and everything that you need. It's not just the housing, the rental. And mm-hmm. um, like yeah. And also because we still have family members in Afghanistan, of course, that's like a constant worry what's going to happen to them, when they will join them. Mm-hmm. And it. the other problem is like, okay, when they will they get to Canada? Like, you know, that's a challenge. Yeah. yeah. And they kind of text me, my sister especially, okay, how long does it take? Have you done anything? I'm like, I'm trying, but no update yet. And I usually say that, okay, that, okay uh-huh. I'm going to let you know if I hear something just to avoid like that question. Mm-hmm. Instead of me saying disappointing them like, all over, I'm like, you know what? If I find something, if I find a way or anything, I will let you know. I'll post it there. And they, they're like, okay. But they, they still, they ask me, okay, what should we do here? And then I ask them to call NH- UNHCR mm-hmm. and ask about the if they have an office in Quetta, what is the process like? Mm-hmm. And also another... Um, problem is I'm still not 100% sure if they should stay in Quetta or Islamabad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's enough. Yeah, there's a whole lot of problems. So. Yeah. And then just you, not knowing when is, what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, like, you know, it's a lot of problems. And then, um, I mean, your immediate, immediate family has, you guys have a lot of uh, kids, right? How many siblings do you have? Uh, I have eight siblings. Oh my gosh. Uh, what are, do you remember their ages? <laughs> Uh, my oldest brother, who is in the U.S. right now, he's studying his master. Uh, he's 35, okay. and my sister is, I think, 28. My brother is 27 or 26, and I'm 24. I will be 24. Different ages. The youngest mm-hmm. one is 11, so let's put it that way. Okay. It's 11, 12, 13, and then there's, uh, I think, 19. Got and it. my sister, who is in Germany, I think she is 22 or 20. She's going to be 23, I think. Okay. Um, so you have your younger siblings um, and I believe your uncle's family, but also is your, is it your brother or sister in credit too with the family? Is it your sister? My sister, my oldest okay. sister, she has two children, two, children okay. two daughters and her husband. Got it. So you have a lot of kids. Um, they need to figure out where to go. Um, I don't know. Are they even thinking, can they go to school anywhere? Or they, do they first have to get th- some type of asylum? You know, they can. They can't they even buy a SIM card without like a Pakistan yeah, ID. So let alone in school. Yeah. yeah. And also one thing that I remember, they said that made it challenging for them. My sister, yeah. my older sister, mm-hmm. she studied medical. So it was her last semester. 
she was oh, hesitant. Goodness. She was like, what if I studied this many years, like six, five, like seven years? What if I stay behind and like do that last semester and get my diploma? And then I, go, I was like, wow, oh, my gosh. you're still thinking about that. Yeah. And she was like, yeah, of course, I wasted so much time when I went to school when I had my children. I was like, oh, wow. yeah, yeah, that's something that just came to my mind. Like it was a challenge. Wow. Um, how many years does it take to, to study for a medical degree? I think she studied like midwifing for oh, okay. midwife for three years and then I think uh, five or six years. Wow. Yeah, and it was a really last semester, yeah. Yeah, that's t- tough one. Um, let me ask you about um, kind of the possibility of resettlement. So what have you found out so far in terms of the possibilities of trying to get your family? Because you are, you know, you are a Canadian permanent resident. How long have you had your permanent residency for? Uh, since 2017. Okay, so it's been a while. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, also I applied for my citizenship, so I don't know when that's going to come. Okay. But, yeah. um, so what, where are you in that process of trying to you know, invite your family out? And it's not just your immediate family, but you have, you know, I guess, your uncle's family there. Um, yeah, your sister has kids. Yeah, uh, I, I already found an organization um, that they have. Uh, I just found out, like, I attended a few, like, information sharing session. They say that people who are out of Afghanistan, there's a potential, like, not all of them, but if they have family members, if they ha- can take care of them, like, take care of their financial responsibility and the settlement, they could be potentially be resettled in Canada. But that's only if they are sponsored through a sponsorship agreement holder. Mm-hmm. There's like a few organizations across Canada that they have agreement with government of Canada that they can bring refugees um, like on an annual basis, but there, um, there's a limit to it. Like, I don't know how many per, per year, but yeah, I got connected to one of them and that's why I moved from Burnaby to Victoria. And I was hoping to get the application on um, I think September 1st, but it didn't happen because the person who is helping me, uh, she's uh, on vacation right now. So she's going to be back on September. So, so far I know that if I have enough money, if I find a few people in Victoria, I can mm. like bring my family here. Okay. But that's a big if. And, like I calculated the money like with someone who's helping me. So I need around like t- uh, 100,000 Canadian dollars to do that. Uh, yeah. I don't know because yeah. it's a it's a lot of people, right? It's like eighteen yeah. people or something. And that's no, and yeah. that calculation is only for ten fem- ten oh, members. Wow. Okay. If I add another nine, it's like two hundred thousand. Oh my gosh! Okay. Yeah. Um, so how long does the process take if you're able to, you know, apply? Like, does it take like six months, twelve months, a couple few years, or what's the timeline look like? Um, I think uh, it's because so many people refugee because of COVID. People were stuck in different countries. Like their work was ready. They were just waiting for their visa. So now they are being, uh, like they're coming to Canada. Because of that, that might slow the process. And also, it really depends how busy the system is. So I'm thinking of a year if everything goes well, I guess. But now, if the Canadian government speed up because of what's going on, that's another thing. But I would say a year or maybe, or Hopefully six months, but six months seems too hopeful. Yeah, yeah. And also it depends how soon I get the funds, you know. I see. As soon as I submit the application, and then once they approve my application, then I have to work on the application that I will send to the Canadian government. Mm-hmm. After that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, um, I was watching that one uh, seminar that you, you know, shared the information to our group, our with the with you know Rabia Shukofa Samaya etc., and I think it was by Mosaic, um, Mosaic in Vancouver, yeah. and um, one of the questions in that seminar was like, what if you don't have the funds right to sponsor? Mm-hmm. And they were saying like, well, the organization, you know, it's a possibility they could fundraise or they can get donations right for that person. So I wonder if that's also an option if. Um, rather than you collecting the money directly, if an organization on your behalf sets up some type of account or, you know, um, thing where um, you could raise the funds through that organization, right? So you could people can donate to the organization and then that could be set aside, right, for your case. Mm-hmm. And um, 
And one of the reasons why I think that might be an interesting possibility is because I was looking at Mosaic's website and they're saying actually that they take, and I'm sure a lot of the other organizations also, but they take, um, it's called in-kind donations. So they could take uh, appreciated stock as a donation. Oh. Like, so for example, if someone bought some uh, a stock very cheap and it's appreciated, um, if they sell it, they might have to pay a lot of tax. And then, oh. and then they donate it, then it's only like, you know, like it's, it's not as much they can donate. But if they have the, the appreciated stock, they don't have to sell the stock. Oh. And so they, they, it's part um, of it. They yeah, you just donate the whole, th whatever s stock you want to that organization. They give a tax deductible receipt to the person. Oh. So that actually helps their taxes. Um, so they pay less taxes that year. And they donate a lot more because they don't have to, you know, sell and pay taxes on, you know, their 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 stock. So that's actually, uh, um, yeah. I think if you can find an organization that can set that up for you, where they could take donations for you and put it aside, and um, yeah, if you could, you know, really get out your story, share, advocate, get on interviews, you know, get on articles, you know. Um, yeah, there's something about tension. So right now, your 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 situation, you have tension where mm -hmm. you, know, you have your family abroad. You've been trying to get them out for so so long. They're out in Pakistan, but you're having a hard time getting them through. You have tension in your story, and so when you share your story, so many tension actually. Yeah, <laughs> well, seriously, so like lots I feel of tension. tension. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you feel the tension, right? When I talk about it, <laughs> but um, you have a lot of tension in the story. But when you get that story out. Um, and if you have a gifted, you know, interviewer or gifted writer or something that shares that story, they're able to, sh to express that tension, which is kind of interesting actually for people. Um, but people feel it and then they feel like they, they feel uncomfortable until that tension gets relieved. So that's part of the reason they want to help you. <laughs> they want to fix their own tension, right? <laughs> I hope more people get uncomfortable <laughs> so that I can bring them sooner. <laughs> exactly. So that's, I think, part of your homework. Mm -hmm. is you need to get more people more people uncomfortable but the mm -hmm. the way you do it you need to get your story out and it's not enough to just get your story out to a few people or a few hundred people you need to shoot wide shoot big um, as big as you can um, get your story out get some connections get some personal connect have people feel you know more about your story and you've got a lot of um you know you've been very courageous with your family um and really you know you've been driving a lot of you know um, their future and you hold a lot on your shoulders um, but yeah when you share that tension others will <laughs> will feel it and they'll be like oh man <laughs> like, yeah they need to relieve that tension somehow um, think about it like that I think I think that might yeah. um, be a tip where you might feel all this tension yourself right like how what do I do what do I do what do I do um, but your problem right now with finances especially um, because you do need a good amount that you don't have. Um, mm -hmm. You need to reach wide and share a lot of that tension um, with others. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I will work on that. Yeah. Yeah. And also regarding your comment about Mosaic, asking them, yeah. I think they mean to do a collective like um, donation. I don't think if they would, but that's a good idea. Probably I could reach out to other organizations. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'm sure each organization is a little different. Maybe they have, you know, I don't see why that would be a complete pr problem if it was, you know. Because for them, they may say like, okay, there's like hundreds of people registered for uh, with us. And then if yeah. you do a like separate like fundraising for everyone, they don't yeah. have that money staff to handle it, you know. Although like I, I think yeah. they have some restriction around it. It has to be like because they had a program for like uh, refugees who were detained in Australia. I think they raised like $3 million or something. And they did it not separately, but saying that, okay, this is the number of people so you have to resettle in Canada. I see. And then that was quite successful too. And that was, I think, last year. Got it. Um, yeah, uh, Fatima, I'm going to go ahead and um, I'll link to your Twitter profile in your um, in the video description below so people can mm -hmm. try to follow. Please update people and you know let people know what's going on. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll link to your um, the interview I did with you and Rabia um, before all of this um, a few weeks ago. I'll re 
um, share that um, as well. Is there any other places people can follow your story and learn more about kind of what things are? What things I do are have an Instagram, but I think okay. mainly Twitter. But Instagram is also like things that uh, articles I share, resources. Mm -hmm. Like the things I say, there's more reference there. Mm -hmm. And also on my Twitter, like I just don't say it. There's articles that I link, videos, people that have interviews. Because uh. Uh, it's like it's real, basically things happening. And yeah, and like the fact that we are from a different ethnic group, that puts us in danger. And even in Pakistan, like that's, um, yeah, that's, that's my biggest worry that I was like, okay, they took this dangerous route. Mm -hmm. They were beaten up, my ankles, yeah. and like his... Uh, San, I think he's 10 or 11. He was like, he has a sprint like uh, elbow. Mm. And these things they saw, my mom was saying, my sisters were crying, like when they were sent back and like the crowded area and stuff. So I'm like, okay, they did, they, re they reached their destination now. Like, what if something else goes wrong at that time? Then I wouldn't think I would forgive myself. Mm. Which is a huge. Uh, I don't know. It's a kind of a nightmare which I don't want to kind of picture it, but I think yeah. that's, uh, you never know. So that's yeah. why the sooner I do this work, it's going to be like I have a peace of mind and also I have them. Yeah. Yeah. I think also one thing to, um, I mean, you do carry a lot of weight on your shoulders. I think part of it could be like you do, you see things like, like you feel responsible for others and you see the significance, right, of, Mm -hmm. what's happening a bit earlier than some others um but i think there's also this thing where you know um you do your best and sometimes sometimes some things are out of our control too you know like mm -hmm. like it's tough to control everything um and sometimes like certain good things happen you know that yeah, are, like exactly. are out of our control but sometimes you know there are things that aren't um, good that happen too um, yeah, and also yeah. because I get in t contacted a lot from Afghanistan, like you know, mm. like people like oh I'm I'm alone by myself or like there was one I think girl she was only 15, and something she asked me I was like okay you should help me because of humanity, mm. that was like really I was like oh my gosh I wish so I, so many people ask me like is there a way to get to Canada or like do you mm. have the application do you have the visa, so like I kind of um, reverse the situation I was like what if what what would happen to my family if I was not here, you know, if yeah. I was part of them at that, like, yeah. that kind of make it like really, yeah. And that's like not my only family situation because they're kind of lucky that I am here. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I will finish off my education and then I could take financial, take care of them financially until they find their own ways. Mm -hmm. But that's not an option for so many families. So that's yeah. why I'm like, okay, yeah, I should do something. Hopefully once they get here, Maybe you can help someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. More people, yeah. hopefully, more power. Definitely. Um, yeah. yeah, it's going to be, I think, um, yeah, there's there's always going to be lots of uh, things that we could do uh, for people, um, definitely. Um, Fatima, um, yeah, it's, it's been a great time getting to know you this past few weeks. It actually feels much longer than just two weeks. I know. <laughs> yeah. So you have been like the hero, obviously. Then I was like, okay, I worked with you too. And like everything yeah. that, because I wouldn't like, if I didn't have you as a reference, mm -hmm. I don't think they would take my words seriously. They're like, okay, how do you know? You have told us like for past six years, nothing happened. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a huge help, like convincing them. Uh -huh. And then, like, organizing how to get there, what to do, like, yeah. yeah. And even now, like, two weeks later, is it two weeks or one week? Oh, yeah, I think it's been two, oh, well, two weeks Almost. since we started. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And still, we were talking about the same problem in a different stage, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I really it, appreciate yeah it, it just feels like we're, it's, it's one, pr one problem after another problem, you know, <laughs> just like. Yeah, <laughs> I do on, on the other side, like in one yeah. corner of my brain, I am kind of brainstorming how to repay or like compensate your work. Oh, no, 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 but no. But it's a separate interview you could have. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't want a compensation or repay or nothing, nothing. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's, um, for me, it, it's not, I don't do anything because like I'm expecting like anything out of it, like I really, it's really like this connection. Like I just feel so, um, like I, I don't, I don't know if I've told people this before, but like, 
like for example, I, we have a, I have a six year old and a three year old, but like、um, the other day, I was looking at my three year olds. Like they're so they're so carefree and they're so happy,、yeah. and、um, and like my kids have such great parents. <laughs> because <laughs> I say that because like it's just objectively like they just have great parents because like they're just so 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 fortunate in so many ways. And when I look at my like three year old daughter's eyes as we we're playing and jumping together, like I look in her eyes and I see like all of the all of the like girls and children of the world. It's this weird thing. It's like、mm. it, it just feels like I'm so connected, and、um, and it's it's. I mean, maybe there's pros and cons to it because in some ways, like it it makes me view the world differently, and、mm-hmm. um, it sometimes it's hard to to、um, to maybe disconnect or feel like that. Not feel that responsibility, you know. Yeah, once I、um, I have noticed that too. Once you feel、mm-hmm. like you know something, yeah, like the more you know, you just want to keep like you know, like opening it up to go deeper. Exactly. So it's like sometimes you feel like okay, it's a lot, but like、yeah. your brain, I don't know, it keeps searching for more and more, like、yeah. which can be challenging. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, definitely. Like I mean, everyone is so connected. We just don't realize how connected we are, you know.、Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think a lot of times I think, especially I、like, say with Afghanistan, it's like people in the West they might think of like, Afghanistan as like this foreign place and people they can't relate with, but、um, in the end we're just all the same. You know, if you take away the language and the culture and the customs and some other stuff, it's like we're just normal human beings. Everybody,、yeah. you know,、um, not much difference and and. Everyone has, you know, their talents and their gifts, and they all like to have fun. They all want、mm-hmm. the best for the future.、Um, we all are so much more similar than I think what we realize.、Um, yeah. Yeah, it's、definitely. just different, like situation. For some people, they live that safety, that peaceful, like you know, life. For some people, they just、yeah. keep searching for that. So I guess、mm-hmm. Afghanistan is that and that kind of situation, like the people. Yeah. Just hope for the best, but I don't know which best are we expecting at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. All right, Fatima, nice chatting with you.、Um, yeah, we'll yeah be in thank、touch. you so much, Dave. And,、um, yeah, thank yeah. you for your time. All right, you've、and、been definitely an inspiration to me and to, to your family、thank、and to you. many others. Thank、yeah. you. I got it from you. Okay, credit goes <laughs> to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, same to you. All right. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to do it by myself. Yeah. Okay. All right, Fatima. We'll see you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good night.